So yes, welcome to our church service today. It's uh, lovely to see you all. Um, let's start our service with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you that we're together today. We've got time to spend with each other and with you. Please bless us, Lord. The world's in a very serious situation now. We you know we've strayed away from you. Please bring us back. Help us to understand that we need you and that we need to love each other and care for each other throughout this crisis. Amen. I've got a song for us to start. Um, it matches the Bible passage that Pastor Thompson sent through today. So you may not know it, but it'll be up on screen and you'll have the words to read. So if you mute yourselves, sing together or just read the words. Said Judas to Mary, now what will you do with your ointment so rich and so rare? I'll pour it all over the feet of the Lord, and I'll wipe it away with my hair, she said. I'll wipe it away with my hair. it could have been sold and think of the blankets and think of the bread you could buy with the silver and gold he said you could buy with the silver and gold to pass over to Pastor Holder. 
Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. It's good to be able to see you all. Today, we just have the privilege of um, Pastor Julian Thompson, who will be preaching for us. Um, Julian Thompson worked in the SEC, I forgot for how many years, but for a decent number of years. Um, but for the last 18 months or so, he has been working as a lecturer at Newport College. Uh, but beyond all that, um, I had the privilege of attending uh, New Bold around the time Julian was there. And I just had the privilege of counting him as, as a friend. And I think one of, the, one, one, one of the best things about being a pastor is being able to invite your friends um, to come and speak and then to share and not only to invite them, but to know that, yeah, that, that they're going to bring a blessing. So Julian, thank you for making the time. Thank you for coming and being with us. And we're just excited to hear what you have to say. So God bless. Thank you, Jonathan, um, for your for your kind words. Um, yes, as, as Jonathan said, um, we we both, how shall I put it, uh, walked those hallowed halls uh, together. Um, Jonathan, um, I would often encounter many times in in deep study and reflection in the in the library, and um, I suppose having met at Newbold. Well, actually, no, we, we knew each other before Newbold, but certainly Newbold is, is, is where our, our, our friendship and the relationship uh, uh, deepened. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to share with Loughborough today. Loughborough um, is one of those places for me that was sort of a name on the motorway <laughs> map. Um, I, I used to pass Loughborough very regularly as I, before studying theology, studied at the University of Nottingham. And so I used to like Loughborough because I knew that when I saw Loughborough, it meant that um, my, my, my road trip was almost um, at an end. Um, so it's nice, I suppose, to finally meet uh, the community of, of Adventists uh, living in Loughborough, a town that um, I, I used to drive past quite frequently on my uh, travels to university. The message for today um, is taken from a passage that is probably very familiar to, to many of you. Um, it's a passage that actually occurs in a number of places in the Gospels. Um, but um, I'm going to take uh, where it's read from in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and reading from verse 6. Uh, reading from the New Revised Standard Version, the Bible says this, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, why this waste? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. For the next few moments, I'd like us to consider the, the title uh, At Jesus' Feet, At Jesus' Feet. Let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, as we open up your word as we seek for these next few moments to quiet all of the noise that is happening and taking place in the world outside of us just to try and pause on your sabbath day to hear your voice we ask that you will speak to us through uh, your word we pray this in jesus's name amen One of the dynamics of reading through the Gospels, and sorry, just, um, just before I begin, I, I have two screens um, here with me. So if you find me looking over here, it doesn't mean that I'm not paying attention to you there. Um, <laughs> 
But um, yes. So anyway, one of the dynamics of reading through the Gospels is that you find that um, many of the stories that occur um, in one Gospel also occur in some of the others as well. And one such story is that of the anointing of Jesus's feet that we've just read in Matthew chapter 26. Um, it also occurs in Luke 7, 36 to 59. It also occurs in Mark and it also occurs in John. Um, so it's one of those stories that actually you find um, repeated in different gospel accounts. And so one of the interesting things you find is that different writers place different emphases. And so having worked my way through these different accounts, I want to suggest to you today that this story of the anointing of Jesus actually becomes all the more powerful when you read it in light of the events of John chapter 11. Bear with me. Listen to this in John chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Can you see how the text makes the connection? Verse two, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with her perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he who you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then I'm just gonna skip across to verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were there with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet. She knelt at his feet 
and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, she was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. She said, where have you laid him? Well, he said, rather, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. Shortest verse in the Bible. Sorry if I spoiled a question for your quiz later. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? And the chapter ends. You see, what's really interesting about this passage, the, 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 the resurrection of Lazarus is one that um, I'm sure many of us are, are familiar with. But what's interesting about this passage is when you start to probe a little bit deeper, there are some details that in light of the story that we previously read about uh, the anointing of Jesus, the story becomes all the more interesting. You see, here in John 11, Mary and Martha's brother is dying, so they send for Jesus, but Jesus doesn't come right away. Lazarus dies, and he's buried in the tomb, and the sisters are left grieving, and when Jesus finally arrives, they come out to meet him. But, you see, this dynamic raises a number of interesting questions. And as you read through closely, there are a number of points in the story that perhaps don't quite seem to add up, or at least not at first. For example, why is it that in John 11 verse 5, when John is describing those who Jesus loves, he mentions Mary by name, he mentions Lazarus by name, so he, he just, he mentions Martha by name, he mentions Lazarus by name, but when it comes to Mary, he just says, Martha's sister. Do you find it curious that, you know, in verse 20, when they heard Jesus was in town, Martha went out to meet Jesus, but Mary stays at home. Is it curious that in verse 28, Martha decides to call Mary aside to let her know that Jesus was asking about her rather than just announcing it like somebody would normally do? Is it interesting that, that Mary uh, is the one who, who comes quickly to Jesus where Martha seems to take her time? Isn't it interesting that Martha's conversation with Jesus in verses 25 to 27 seems to lead to a, a doctrinal discourse, but Mary's conversation with Jesus sees the Savior overcome with weeping? You see, there's something going on here beneath the surface. And of all the gospel writers, John in particular is hinting and trying to point our attention to a story that is taking place within the story. And in John chapter 11, verse 2, we begin to find that hint as to what it is, because you see, one of the first pieces of information that John wants to communicate to us is that the Mary that is being spoken of in this story is the Mary who wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Before anything else, before we're told anything else, John wants to let us know that there is something about Mary. Now, you see, what I would suggest to you is that to, to, to really begin to unpack the importance of this statement. It takes us bringing to this the accounts that we find in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. Bear with me. I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. Bear with me. 
Luke 7, 36 to 39. Listen to how Luke recounts this event. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Now, I, I, I don't want us to miss it. Luke tells us that at this moment when this woman, Mary, is wiping the feet of Jesus, that she is a sinner. Not was, not had been, but in that moment, she is a sinner. Now, what makes this significant is the fact that when you follow the chronology in the book of John, John seems to suggest that this feast took place after Lazarus had been resurrected from the dead. Some of you are nodding, which means some of you can see where it is that I'm going with this. Now, now I have to pause here because you see the implications of this fact are mind blowing. Because you see, what it means is that in John 11, before the feast had taken place, in verse 5, Webel says Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It suggests to us that Jesus loved Mary even though she was still a sinner living in sin. I think I need to repeat that. The chronology suggests to me that it means that Jesus loved Mary even though she was still a sinner living in sin. And I want to suggest to you that, that this simple fact that undoubtedly you know already be, really begins to unlock the story. Because you see, now when we look at John chapter 11, things start to make a little bit more sense. Because you see, when Mary and Martha had heard that Jesus was in town, maybe the reason why Mary stayed behind is because she knew about Jesus's miracles. She already heard his teaching. She knew what type of a man uh, uh, he was. And perhaps she knew that her life wasn't right. And so she did not feel worthy to present herself before him. Maybe the reason why Martha calls Mary aside out of the presence of the guest to let her know that Jesus wants to talk to her is because Martha knew Mary's reputation. Martha knew what Mary got up to at night. And so maybe what's happening is that she doesn't want Jesus to be seen to be talking with a woman like Mary. Martha believes that she's doing the right thing in protecting Jesus's reputation. Perhaps the reason why, why Mary runs to Jesus is just a demonstration of the fact that really Mary wanted to go to him all along, but perhaps Mary herself, she recognized her, her own position. She knew what people said about her. And so she was worried about how a man would respond to a woman like her.
But you see, one of the most profound things about this dynamic, it has to be the conversation that takes place between Mary and Jesus in John 11, 27. Let me read it for you. I will go from verse 28. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. Mary comes to Jesus and she falls at his feet. And when Jesus see her, sees her, the sight of this woman, the sight of this sinner weeping at his feet moves his very heart. The sight of a sinner we, weeping at his feet moved the very heart of the Son of God. You see, when you start to, to really look at the language that's expressed here, what you find is that, is that what's actually happening here is that Mary falls at Jesus' feet. And as Jesus sees her, Jesus is having difficulty repressing his emotions. He is overcome at this sight. And Jesus looks down upon her and he sees her weeping. And tears begin to form in his own eyes. He can barely control himself. Perhaps, perhaps Mary had recollections of another time at Jesus' feet. Listen to this in Luke 10, 38. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Perhaps Mary was the sort of person who, when they walk into church, 
the buzzing starts. You know the sort of buzzing I'm talking about? The sort of buzzing that occurs when there are lots of people all speaking at the same time, but they're speaking in such a way as not to allow others to hear what it is that they're saying. Perhaps Mary was that person who people complained in relation to how she was dressed. Perhaps Mary was that individual who has a reputation within the community that's not a good one. Mary was the one with the inappropriate Saturday night Facebook posts. But you know what? Mary was also that one who, in spite of the buzzing, in spite of the comments, in spite of the fact that she knew that everybody was speaking about her and her history and screenshotting her social media accounts and sending them to the pastor and the elders, she would still turn up to church. Perhaps Mary was that individual who knows that her, or knew rather that her life wasn't right. She knew that she wanted a change, but maybe didn't quite know how to go about it. Maybe Mary was the type of person for whom just saying to Mary, I'll pray for you was not quite enough. She needed somebody who would be a bit more hands-on in the help that was being offered. Perhaps Mary is that, that, that individual who in spite of all uh, that she has done, she gets this sense that there is just something about Jesus that means that she can't stay away. There's something about Jesus that makes that buzzing sound when she walks into a room. It makes it worth enduring those stares, those sneers, those looks. Perhaps Mary's that individual who, who recognizes that there is something about Jesus that it makes it worth enduring the self-righteous remarks and the judgmental comments. Because you see, one thing that Mary realized that it seems nobody else in these stories realized is that at the feet of Jesus, the only person who's actually qualified to judge, there is no condemnation. Some scholars suggest that Mary might even have been the woman who was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8. You know the story? Early in the morning, he came to the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say, Jesus? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote in the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the elders and Jesus was left alone with the woman. Jesus straightened up and he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go away and from now on do not sin 
again. Perhaps unlike the others, Mary realized that at the feet of the savior, there is no condemnation. See at Jesus' feet, Mary realized that the savior in fact weeps with the sinner. But not only that, at Jesus' feet, Mary learned that at his feet, there is power to resurrect not only a corrupted life, but a corrupted body. And you see, Jesus, not only at Jesus' feet does Mary see that there is power to resurrect a corrupted life and a corrupted body, but at Jesus' feet, Mary then sees her brother raised from the dead. And so it makes sense. That Jesus' feet is the place to which Mary goes. At his feet, she realizes that there's no condemnation, even though she's a sinner. At his feet, even though Jesus is God, she finds that God himself is moved to tears at her presence. There is resurrection power. There is forgiveness of sins. There is peace. And so perhaps, perhaps out of all of the encounters that Jesus has, perhaps Mary, was the one who best understood the nature of the gospel. See, sometimes we overcomplicate things. Sometimes like Martha, we find ourselves engaged in, in theological discourses and we miss the point that is simply this. You see, if Jesus can restore somebody like Mary, then Jesus can restore people like you and me. Pastor Jonathan asked an interesting question in Sabbath school. Are we more like Uzziah or are we like Isaiah. It's a challenging question. Because the truth is, is that oftentimes if we honestly reflect on who we are, even though we carry the title Christian, we may not actually like what it is that we see. But my question is this, when we don't like what we see in us, are we willing to go to Jesus' feet? Are we willing to allow others to maybe talk about us? Are we willing to put up with stairs to say, oh, do you know what? He's an elder. How is it that he can go forward for pastor's appeal? Are we willing to put up with people whispering about us? Are we willing to put up with a certain amount of shame in our pursuit of the Savior? It's a challenging story that raises all sorts of challenging questions. But for those of us who will be honest and say at times, we find ourselves in situations similar to Mary. 
it doesn't have to be challenging. Instead, it can be encouraging. Because as I said before, if Jesus can save someone like Mary, then there's no doubt that Jesus can save you and me. So don't forget, at Jesus' feet, there is no condemnation. At Jesus' feet, the Savior weeps with the sinner. At Jesus' feet, there is resurrection power. At Jesus' feet, there is forgiveness of sin. At Jesus' feet, there is peace for those of us who have sin sick souls. At Jesus' feet, there is everything that anyone could ever need. Amen. Thank you very, very much for your message. Um, now, before we have our last song, um, it would be good for us to have a time of prayer. So I've asked uh, Pastor Holder to lead that for us. Okay, um, we're going to come and have a time of prayer. I want to thank Julian just for reminding us um, that there is a place to we can, where we can go for every need we have. Amen. Um, for our personal needs, um, for recognition of who we are, um, for healing, for comfort. And so we want to just have, have a time of prayer now and almost just take our place at Jesus' feet. Um, I guess there have been various things which... Uh, that we mentioned today, which we can pray for. Um, and what I want to do is maybe just give people an opportunity, if there is something you won't pray for, just to write it in the comments. Uh, just put it in the comments to like everybody so we can see it. Um, so anything specific in which you won't pray for. We recognize not only that, but what's, what's also what's going on in our country. Uh, 10 months into the pandemic, we are at the worst point that we possibly could be. Uh, which I think is something which saps everyone's energy. We, we've, we've seen what's gone on in America, um, and that's something we also want to pray for. We've also heard about the plane which has gone down um, today or which they've lost. So there's various things that are going on. So if there's anything else on top of that which you want us to pray for, I just want to invite you just to put it into the comments and um, into the chat so that we can see it. Um, thank you, Jonathan, um, for what you placed in the comments. That's good, probably like another minute or so for anyone else just to write something to put in the comments. And then, um, sorry, just got to allow my wife to write. Um, and then I guess at this point, I think I will, once we've had the time and just seen what people have to put in the comments, um, I will just, yeah, pray for everything which people have um, put in. So if you want to write something again, please feel free just to put a message in the comments. Obviously, we're going to pray for the COVID situation, uh, the situation in the USA, what's happening um, with the plane that's just gone down and I guess various other things in the world, but also, um, yeah, anything else which anybody wants to pray for. So it can be prayers of thanks, it can be requests. Um, and yeah all those things. So I give probably like 10, 15 seconds if you're writing, do what you're doing quickly. Um, and then we'll just begin to pray. And then we'll have um, a final song and then a closing prayer from Pastor Thompson. Okay, so let's pray. Um, Dear Lord, we just want to thank you just for that reminder that there is a place of security. Um, whatever is going on in the world, whatever is happening in our lives, whatever we think of ourselves or other people think of us, that, that we can go to your feet and find comfort and acceptance and love and help. And so we come here just wanting to ask you to step in and to continue to be with our government and our leaders, not only in the UK, but, but, but across the entire world. This is still a struggle we are going through with coronavirus. People are still losing loved ones. And we just want to ask that you would step in, um, that you would 
uh, restrict the situation, that, that, that you would bring more light and more hope. Uh, but not only that, that you will provide comfort to those families who have already lost loved ones to coronavirus. We want to pray for the situation in America in terms of um, the election. We want to pray for Donald Trump and Joe Biden and all the leaders and people who are involved. Lord, we recognize that this is your world. Like you read in Isaiah, the whole earth is full of your glory, but yet you see how we conduct ourselves as people. Mm. And we pray that you would be involved yourself in those situations. We want to pray for the plane, which has um, also gone down and, and, and those people who... I guess they're sending search parties out for. We, we, we pray that they would find survivors, um, that um, you would bring this situation to a swift conclusion, that it wouldn't be something which drags on for weeks and months as they try to find it. And Lord, you see everything we've prayed for in the comments section. We want to um, thank God um, that Kyle is home from hospital after breaking his hip. Uh, we want to thank God for Sophie's mom's negative COVID test. We want to pray for Sheila Aggie. Um, who is in the hospital in Liverpool in an induced coma. I want to ask that, that you would be with um, Sophie and others who are looking for work and that they are able to find a job um, that they enjoy. Um, we want to thank you um, that you brought um, David Benton um, through peritonitis. Um, we want to just pray that, that everyone will have mental peace at this challenging time. We want to especially pray for the NHS workers who are having to see and deal with things that they've not had to before, probably ever. Uh, we want to pray for Liv's relationship with, with, with her sister. Um, and we want to pray for my studies, for Sophie's studies, for everyone who's studying, for all the school students um, and all people who are doing GCSEs and A-levels and university students who find themselves mm. studying under the most challenging circumstances. We want to ask that you will be involved in, in that situation. Um, Lord, you recognize all the other requests or thanks which haven't been mentioned. Um, but even though they haven't been mentioned publicly, we know that we are able to bring them to your feet. Um, I just want to thank you, uh, like Mary, thank you for the difference that coming to your feet, that coming to you has made to our lives and will continue to make to our lives. In your name, amen. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And let's have our last hymn then. This one's chosen by Gudrun. There is a hope. Let's sing this together. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing of glory now revealed in me part yet drives a cloud away I stand in Christ with sins on you and Christ in me the hope of hell my cry is calling and my
Lord, the truth is that um, we are living in difficult times. And many of us, Lord, we, we are looking for, for help that we know only you can give. I pray, Lord, that in spite of what may be going around us, going on around us, that we may find time to be at your feet and in so doing, find ourselves sustained, renewed, um, empowered, strengthened for the road that lays ahead. Help us, Lord, not to fall into that dangerous pathway of being self-sufficient. But perhaps, Lord, maybe like Mary, we may learn that at your feet, you will indeed supply all that we need according to your richness in, in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we will all be encouraged. I pray, Lord, that we'll all feel perhaps a little more reassured as we think beyond Sabbath to the rest of our weeks and what might lay ahead. Lord, we thank you for the grace that is accessible through your Son. Empower us to claim it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.